Record. Okay, ladies, we are recording. I am so excited. Welcome to our Tuesday night webinar with Jennifer Kolari from Connected Parenting. Honestly, I'm so pumped to have this discussion because within TLC, I really want us to provide you with the resources in all areas of your life. And parenting, obviously, if you're a mom or soon to be mom, this is such a huge part and consumes everything. You know, women. We, men are very good at compartmentalizing and women, everything just kind of blends together. So your personal, your family, your work, it all kind of becomes one. But the great thing about that is so many of the tools and techniques we're gonna be talking about today, you can use in your professional life and your friendships and all around. So I really hope that whether you are a parent or not, you'll get a lot out of this. I'm not a mom and I love this topic because it really helps me to learn more about myself, what kind of parent I would be, and also helps me better understand my parents and have a better relationship with them. So Jennifer, I'm gonna let you take it away, do your thing, and, um, and then we'll chat throughout. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So I'll just tell you a little bit about me and my work. So I'm actually, a, well, I'm a child and family therapist. I'm also a clinical social worker and I've worked with families and kids maybe the last, I guess, probably almost 30 years now. And I love what I do. Oh, you froze for a second. Oh, I love what I do. I think kids are amazing and weird and they can teach us so much about ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, this work actually started, I did my undergraduate degree in psychology and I wanted to do something real and kind of work with real families and get out there and do really amazing work. And, and people, who, if, if you're familiar with my work, you'll know this story, but it really is the origin. Um, I started working with kids in, in a group home. Um, and these were kids who were street kids. Um, they had been sexually abused and physically abused. They were deeply traumatized. They were tough. They were scary. They were mean. And I had no idea what I was doing. Um, and we were actually um, trained in this group home not to connect to these kids. We were taught to, you know, don't, don't turn your back on them and, you know, don't give an inch, they'll take a mile, like be really tough on them. And if you're soft, they'll take advantage of you. And, you know, when it's time to put them to bed, it was just close the door and go downstairs and work on your logs. And it drove me crazy because some of these kids were 11. They were 11 to 16 years old. They were babies who'd been through horrid things. And I just could not follow that. I just couldn't. So, especially when it was bedtime, right? When the makeup came off and the teddy bears came out and the jammies came on, they turned back into kids, right? They turned back into babies and they were afraid and they were living in a place where people were paid to look after them. They'd been through awful things. So I would rub their backs and I would sing them lullabies and I would tell them bedtime stories and they were so tough and so scary, but they just melted into this and they just became vulnerable and it actually broke my heart. Sometimes they would cry. Sometimes I would cry. And it was just like, oh, it was so hard. And I kept thinking, you know, where was I when I was that age? I was home in my house with my, you know, parents at the end of the hallway, my dog on my bed. And so it was really, it was a, it was a pretty powerful experience. And, but I noticed the next day when I needed those kids to do the things that I needed them to do, they were much more likely to do it for me. Mm -hmm. So I really noticed the connection between compassion and empathy and, and love really and compliance. And it was very interesting because the other staff were all like, oh, she's a bleeding heart. This is going to backfire. They're going to walk all over her, but they didn't actually. Um, and I always tell this story, but I love it. There was a little girl who was really tough. She was, she, we'd had meetings for weeks about this girl because she was very, very behavioral. And uh, she'd been at the house about a week and a half and she loved the bedtime routine. She didn't want to talk about it the next day, but she loved it. And she was actually moving to another group home. She was only receiving home. So kids were only there for a few weeks before they were you know, placed in a more permanent home. And uh, she was walking out to the car with her social worker moving out. And she stopped on the sidewalk and she came running back up and she put her hands on my cheeks. And she said, I just want to remember this face, the face of someone who actually cared about me. So mm -hmm. I never forgot that moment because I knew that was the moment that I wanted to be a social worker. And I also knew that I wanted to understand compassion and empathy, the power of it, what it can do for you, why it's so hard for some of us to get there, why we get so angry so quickly and why we think that anger is going to be the answer. Um, and I really devoted the next 30 years to figuring this out and then eventually um, coming up with the Connected Parenting Program, which is really based on compassion and empathy, deep, deep listening, 
and what happens biochemically. It's, it's based on psychoneurobiology. So what happens in the brain and in the body when you're in a state of just deep understanding and listening, that that's really medicine, powerful medicine. And then I teach parents how to use that, almost the same skills that a therapist would use to create emotional safety. So when you have to come in and set limits and make rules and follow through and say what you mean and mean what you say, which you have to do, it just works better. It just works as a, as a system the way it's supposed to. Um, and the one thing I'll mention quickly and then we can get it right into questions is, um, you know, we really, we think of ourselves as parents, but we're not. <laughs> we're basically, the, the frontal lobe, which is the part of the brain that regulates, inhibits, organizes, prioritizes, motivates, helps us make good decisions, takes perspective, that part of the brain isn't even finished growing till 25, maybe even in the 30s. So with our, especially our little ones, and teenagers are a different story, we can get to that, um, but they don't have much of a frontal lobe. Like they have a little one, but it's not finished growing. So you're not actually parents, you're substitute frontal lobes. That's what you are. And your job is to inhibit, organize, prioritize, motivate. That's what your job is all day long. And that's why when parents say, I'm like, how come I have to say something 50,000 times? Why do I have to yell before my kids will listen to me? Because they're looking for that inhibition. They're looking for that feeling of that substitute frontal lobe. And it is it's a confusing time to parent. There's a lot of mixed messages. Um, there's, we can get into that in a minute. But the parents are frustrated and they, kids are different today. They're spicy. They're feisty. They're smart. They know way more than we did when they were kids. They have so much more access to information. You know, the whole world moves faster. Little kids are growing up on devices. So they know a lot and they're not afraid of adults. And, and as adults, we don't know what to do when our kids just say, no, make me. I don't care. <laughs> it's really hard to know what to do in those situations. So that's what we'll talk about today, how to sort of dig into that and really give parents some amazing tools. It, it really is like a superpower. I don't, there's no other way to say it. It really is. Very cool. Yeah. I love that. What? When you say, are you going to get into this as well? When you say that we are their frontal lobe, what are effective ways to communicate and for us to not react when we're needing to repeat something a million times? Right. And this is the whole thing. This is it, right? When you're parenting, you are constantly regulating your kids. They are constantly pushing back. So let me talk about the brain first and we'll get into all of this. Right. So the way the brain works is you got your frontal lobe. We already talked about what the job of the frontal lobe is. And then you have your midbrain. And that's the part of the brain, the limbic brain, that freaks out. It gets mad. It gets anxious. It has temper tantrums. It yells. It, uh, it gets, you know, has panic attacks. That's the part of the brain that is reacting to the world instead of responding to the world. And there's a constant battle in everyone's brain between what's danger, what's scary, and what's what's not and that's the frontal lobe's job to kind of regulate that and make those decisions and so we have to do that for ourselves but we also have to do that with our kids and for our kids so what i guess the first thing to really understand is that it takes so long to grow a frontal lobe and thank goodness we don't have to give birth to 25 year olds because that would be hideous um but what what has to happen is we have to keep this very very strong connection with our children so that we can help them grow for those many, many years um, in order to develop and grow their own frontal lobe. So human babies are basically born premature. They're basically giant head with a tiny body. They can't sit up, they can't roll over, they can't feed themselves, they can't really do anything. Um, they're completely dependent on us. I don't think there's any other animals that are as helpless as humans when we are born. And so the bond between the parent and the child is critical because you have to think of childhood as like a very long fourth trimester right? And that's where you're really staying connected with them so that they are oriented to you and they're looking to you for everything they need, but you're also creating enough safety for them so that they actually can grow up and grow a frontal lobe of, of their own. And then you become your own parent. That's kind of how it works. So the best way, and this is, you know, we'll dive into this over the next hour, but I've developed this, this sort of cornerstone technique of connected parenting is something called the calm technique. And in this technique, what you're doing is you're speaking to anyone, not just your child, but, and it works on husbands, wives, mother-in-laws, bosses, anyone who needs to be deeply understood, anyone who needs to be de-escalated or diffused, this is, this is where the superpower comes in. So it's a way to deeply listen. And when you do that, you're releasing beautiful reward chemicals into the brain. So 
the good news is we're all pretty good at this. It's basically a form of mirroring and we're all really good at it with babies. Nobody would pick up a baby and go, hi, how are you? Like nobody does that. You pick up a baby and go, oh my goodness, look at that little face and aren't you good? And while you're doing that, oxytocin, opiates, and powerful, powerful reward chemicals are flooding the brain, calming the baby down, settling the baby down so the baby knows they're safe so they can now take risks explore, reach for things, crawl away from you, all of that stuff. Because that bond is so strong, they can continue on with brain development, which mostly happens out of utero, not in. Mm -hmm. So not only are you the substitute frontal lobe, but you're also the architect of your child's brain. So their experiences and the things that they learn from you and all of this stuff that we teach them is actually building their brain. So it sounds a little daunting, it does, but um, once you figure out how powerful that bond is and how powerful these techniques are. It, it's, it really is a superpower. It's phenomenal. So do you want me to kind of get into that oh, technique? Awesome. I'm excited. <laughs> um, so I call it the calm technique. So there's four things that you are doing when you are deeply, deeply connecting and listen, listening to another human being. First of all, this is all any of us ever want. Any fight you've ever had with anyone is because you just want to be heard. And when you're not heard, what do you do? You escalate. You create an escalation in the conversation so the person's actually gonna get how upset you actually are. What, what ends up happening is that person's doing the same thing. So you just end up doing this. Your, your messages are basically just bouncing off of one another. And you keep escalating and escalating and escalating. And that's when we get re reactive and that's when we get upset or we yell. So in those moments, it's like you're both hitting the send button and nobody's listening to anybody. So we do this naturally with babies. Right? We know how to just go, oh my goodness, oh, it's so a baby, you know, comes out of the bath, they're fussing, they're cold. You don't go, oh, I don't understand what your problem is. You've had a bath every night for four months. You're fine. And I've got to go watch my show. Nobody, you know, you would look at a baby and go, oh my goodness, you're cold and your little lips are quivering and this towel feels kind of scratchy. And the baby doesn't know what you're saying, but the baby sees on your face a perfect representation of what they are feeling inside, which releases oxytocin opiate and very powerful reward chemicals that soothe the baby and calm the baby down so they can respond to their environment instead of react. And that happens over and over and over again. It's a very important part of brain development. But we kind of start to drop this. We lose this from our repertoire around the time that children acquire language. So once they can speak, we stop the mirroring. So, I mean, for the parents listening, you'll relate to this. When you have your four-year-old and they won't get out of a bath, it's not, oh, you're having the best time, I understand. It's like, get out of the bath, please. Mommy's asked you four times. Look at your brother. He's already out of the bath. One, two, three, three and a half. That's what we end up doing, right? We end up getting so upset that our children are not listening to us. We start escalating. Therefore, they're having the best time. Who wants to get out of a bath? Nobody. It's cold when you get out. It's miserable. It's a state change. Kids live in the now. They don't know it's time to go to bed. They don't care. They're having the best time. And so we end up conflicting. And what the child does is continuously send a message of how much they don't want to get out of the bath. And as a parent, we get so upset. Why don't you listen just once? Just once can you do what mommy asked? We're also thinking about all the 50,000 other things we have to do. We need our child to get out of the bath. And that charges the whole situation. So most of us um, do this naturally, but we start to drop it when our kids are speaking. And if you look at the difference between a parent that has an 18-month-old who's not talking versus an 18-month-old who's talking well, that parent is probably going to be doing a lot less mirroring. So many, many years ago, um, there was a shift in parenting, and it shifted from what's called a parent-centered model. Parents are here. Kids are here. There's a hierarchy to a child-centered model where it's really about tuning into your child and what are their needs and let's never say no and let's negotiate and let's make sure that we, we you know, protect our self-esteem and timeouts hurt their feelings and all of that stuff, which was very well-meaning. But because we are the frontal lobe, we stopped being really good frontal lobes. Mm -hmm. And so as a therapist, I am now seeing an entire generation of kids who are anxious, who procrastinate, who are depressed, um, who do not emotionally regulate particularly well, who don't focus particularly well, um, all problems that happen when the frontal lobe is understimulated. Wow. 
So it's a really big issue and kids are really suffering there. I mean, lots of kids are doing fine, but the numbers of kids that are struggling with mental health issues, it's overwhelming, you know, high schools and guidance departments. It's overwhelming universities. Kids are struggling. They're having a hard time and parents know it. So all of this was very well-meaning and it came from a place of really wanting to create um, good self-esteem and strength, but we kind of let go of the frontal lobe thing. And that's been a bit of a problem. Yeah. So what connected parenting does is it helps you to really nurture, really be empathic, really connect with your child so that you have the emotional safety set up. So when you have to set limits, which you have to, they don't have a frontal lobe. That's why six-year-olds don't have apartments. They don't know when to go to bed. They just punch someone when they want something. They'll eat a whole box of cookies. They don't care. They don't understand. So we have to be the frontal lobe. And because we're not doing the best job at that, not because we don't care, but because we've been given all of these incredibly mixed messages about how to parent, um, it's kind of flipped upside down. And, and if you even just watch um, media, watch what kids are watching, it's really, and first of all, I don't even watch TV anymore. Now it's all these quick little YouTube -y things, but um, the, the programs that are out there are, well, let's start this way. Think about the shows we watched when we were little. We watched shows where the adults were in charge where there was chaos and the kids kind of got themselves in a mess, but it was the adult, the uncle, the parent, the principal, whoever it is that helped the kids learn their lesson. And that's gone. Now a lot of programming is the kids know everything. They're all sarcastic. They're all super bright. The adults are all idiots. They're all really, they're stupid, silly, ridiculous people who don't know anything, especially TV dads. Um, kids know everything. And there's this general sense that kids feel like there's nobody in charge. Yeah. I should not be in charge. I'm a kid. And I work with kids all the time and they tell me they, don't, they do not want to be in charge. That's what escalating behavior is about. It's about getting someone to go, hey, cut it out, mm -hmm. right? That's the difficulty. So then if you do have a child or you're, you've adopted a child or you're coming in as a step parent and your child is exhibiting some of these symptoms of anxiety and how do you, by using the calm technique and do you almost reparent your child or are there other techniques that you can use oh, also to help? A question. We'll talk about that because there is a little bit of that, especially, and you can do that with your own child mm -hmm. having behavioral issues. Or if you're, if it's a blended family and you're really trying to build those connections and those mm -hmm. relationships, um, then you do some of the reparenting, but I'll get to that. So let me finish the calm technique because that's, that's a really excellent question. So the way that you do this um, is by, so, so I've, I've called it the calm technique. So the first letter is C. This is where you connect. This is where you put your phone down, where you use your face, your body, all of your energy to demonstrate to that person, whoever it is, that you really just want to get them. You don't, it's not about agreeing. It's not about convincing. It's not about, um, changing their mind in at the beginning, it's literally, I just want to get you. I just want to know where you're coming from, which is what all of us want any, anyway. The next letter is A, so this is the affect matching. So this is where the look on your face really has to match the look on their face. It can't be exactly the same because that's weird, but it's gotta be close, right? So if your child is really angry because they were drawing something and it didn't work and they ripped it up and I hate this, I hate my life, and this is the worst picture ever. And we come in and we're, um, Oh, honey, it's okay. You know what? We'll find. There's no match there, right? They, and all he's gonna look at mom or dad and go, "Well, pff, she doesn't get it at all." I've got to ramp this baby up so she actually understands how upset I actually am, right? So it's really important to get that match right. This is also where you take your agenda and you park it. I promise you, you get to bring it back, but not yet. You've got to create that space. You've got to create that safety first so that you can um, come in later with the limit setting. Okay, so that's so the agenda, get out of the bath, don't do that, what do you mean, you, why did you rip that up, that's your homework, whatever it is that you're upset about, you park it and you bring it back later. The next part is L, so this is where you are listening, this is where you're using your words, you are, and you can paraphrase, you can summarize, you can clarify, or you can wonder out loud, those are the four things that you can do. And um, the M stands for mirroring. So when you've done that, you've mirrored. So let me walk you through an example because that's usually the best way to do it. So I just gave the example of a kid who was drawing something, they freaked out, they ripped it up. 
let's say they worked on it for a really long time and at the very end they ruined it and they're devastated. So the, the kind of main thing you have to understand is you've got to kind of put yourself in their, sh in your, their, in their shoes. What if you had just worked on an, an amazing, and this has happened to me, phenomenal PowerPoint, right? And it's amazing. It's the best thing you've ever done. You've spent hours and hours on it and you hit something and it's gone and you are freaking out and your husband comes in and says, oh, honey, you know what? Don't worry about it. You can start again. You know, just do it from memory. You know what? Sometimes it's even better the second time. Is that going to work on you? No, you're going to freak out. You're no, you're going to try and convince that person how bad the situation actually is. And so often when we enter into a conflict or um, a situation where someone needs to be calmed down, we think we're going to calm them down by offering the solution or telling them what they should really be doing or think on the bright side or cheerleading or whatever it is that we do. And we know that we hate that. That doesn't work on us. We don't like that. You don't want to complain to your husband. Oh, this just happened to me. And he goes, Oh, well, I, I don't know why you just don't do this, this, and this. And we've talked about this before. And why don't you No, that's awful. We hate that. And that just usually makes us escalate. So the thing we have to remember is put ourselves in our ch children's shoes. They are nine or however old they are. They've just done the best picture of their life and ruined it at the last minute. We know because we're their frontal lobe, it's not the end of the world. They will learn from this. They will eventually make a better picture next time that you learn the best things from mistakes, right? That you get yourself back up and you take it on again. Like all of that stuff we know, but they don't know that in that moment. And they don't want to hear that in that moment. So in that moment, you would use your face, your body to connect. You would look at them and they would say, this is the best picture and now it's ruined and I'm never going to be able to draw anything that amazing again, right? And what we normally say is something like, honey, don't say that. Like you could, let, I'll help you. Let's start again. No, I don't want to start again. So see the escalation? Because I'm not meeting them where they are. So you take your agenda, which is, oh my gosh, is my kid going to be someone who flips out all the time? If they don't learn how to stick to something, they're never going to get anywhere in life. You have this moment as a parent where everything flashes before your eyes. You put that aside and you say, oh my God, you worked so hard on that. You were, walking, you were working on that 45 minutes ago. It was amazing. I know, mommy. Now you're going to get nodding. Now you're going to get this, not ah, uh, right? When you're doing that, and you'll feel it. You will feel the oxytocin releasing. Oxytocin is a very powerful neurotransmitter. It's also a, a stress hormone. And basically, it calms the whole body down. It, it blocks cortisol. It increases neuroplasticity. It strengthens the immune system. It improves emotional regulation. It's free. You don't need a prescription. You never run out of it. You can't overdose on it. Like There's just a billion reasons why. Um, learning to use this technique and learning to get this beautiful oxytocin blast for your children. And for you, by the way, because when you use this, it all bounces back and your brain gets the same benefits. So when you have that moment where it's, I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to think about all the things I have to do. I'm not going to freak out and think I'm a bad mother because my kid flips out every time they're drawing something. I'm just going to be present with you in this moment. That is hard to do when you're a parent. But you started at the beginning saying moms feel everything so intensely. It's happening to you when your child is freaking out. You want them to feel better. So the trap you get into is, can't you just feel better so I can feel better? <laughs> That's never going to work, right? That's never going to work. So you kind of have to be brave enough to visit your child in that space. Just sit with them. Three, and the crazy part is it's literally three or four statements. He'll say, oh, I'm never going to draw another picture this good again. I hate my life. And you say, oh, totally you would feel that way, especially when you worked so hard on it. It was perfect. And then at the last minute, that scribble happened or whatever it is. As you do that, three or four statements is all you need. You don't need to lie your child down and do a therapy session. It's literally three or four statements. The oxytocin starts flowing. You're now having an oxytocin-based response instead of a fight-or-flight adrenaline-based reaction. Now the child starts to calm down and now you can have a conversation about learning and taking a break and let's try later and all the good stuff, all the good stuff that you need to do. We'll talk about later what happens when they go into what I call a vortex because sometimes kids can just flip out and they're just gone and you know they're gone. They have that crazy look on their face and they're just, their frontal lobe is just off um, and what to do in those situations. But more often than not, I get parents all the time saying, I can't believe it. I just used it. It literally diffused the tantrum in seconds. And it'll work on adults. 
It's incredible. It's mind blowing. It literally is a superpower. It is not, it is very counterintuitive. It is the opposite of what your brain is going to tell you to do. You're going to feel like going, are you kidding me? Can't you just, that's what your brain is going to tell you to do. But you've got to be able to sit in that space where you can meet them there first. So you asked another question in your question, which is how do you react? How do you calm down your own reactions? How do you deal with this? Because kids are very triggering. They are. And you might've just dealt with another situation 10 minutes before with your other kid. <laughs> like it's, it's, and, and it's the end of the day and you're tired. So there's no easy answer. You have to keep your own frontal lobe working in order to be a good frontal lobe for your own children. You're going to have your own childhood triggers. It is going to take you to a place where you panic. The neatest thing about this is you can learn to do this. I won't say by rote because that's not right. You can learn the steps of this and how to do this in a very precise way, even though they may be emotionally triggering for you. And as you heal your child this way, you're going to heal yourself, right? And when you, the best part is when you blow it, because you're going to blow it. Of course, you're going to blow it. You're going to freak out. You're going to scream. You're going to stand taking all your crayons. If you can't handle it, we're going to give them to a child who will actually appreciate them. You're going to do that. And then you get to go back. You can repair a mirror, right? You can go back and go, oh. Remember yesterday when I freaked out and I grabbed all your crayons and you were just so upset about that picture you did and you were so upset about the way it turned out and I was yelling and screaming. That must have felt awful. And I thought about that all day. That's such a beautiful repair. So you get to blow it. You're going to blow it. I blow it. Everybody blows it. And the truth is, if you never yelled and never lost it, you'd, you'd mess your kids up anyway. Because they'd go to work one day at 30 and someone's going to yell at them and they're going to fall apart because they're not going to know what to do. So a real reaction. Um, when you push and push and push or you overreact to things, you're going to make people who love you upset. That's just kind of the reality. So everybody should be working on being their best self, but life happens. Emotions happen. They're not the bad things that people make them out to be. So did you have a question? Um, no, I love that. I think that was really beautiful. I think you're going to cover the other stuff after too, because I, the only other question is, the is part of that repair process. So part of what you were talking about before of the society we're living in now where children are anxious and, and have these symptoms of the society that we're living in, what are different tools and techniques that we can use? So, to okay, so let me, so this is such a good question because that technique, that calm technique is, is the sort of uh, flagship. That's, that's the, the, that's the most important technique and that is medicine. So as you use that technique regularly with your children, you are building emotional resilience. You are building connection. You are speeding up neuroplasticity. You are helping your kids learn better and learn faster. That itself, connection is actually the antidote to addiction. Mm -hmm. And our kids today are more addicted and we're more addicted to all kinds of things than we ever have been before. And so um, connection is the antidote to that. So the, the biggest answer is this needs to become, and the, the tricky part about this is that people hear this technique and they're like, oh, that sounds easy. I can do that. And then you go to do it and you're like, what? I don't know what to do. It's so hard. It, this is why we have training. This is why I teach parents how to do it. This is how, why we coach people to do it because it's actually a therapy technique. You're not supposed to be able to hear it and just do it right away. But I will tell people that even the clumsiest initial attempts even the, if the intention is to try and to really understand, it's going to work. So if you start doing it and your kid's like, why are you saying everything that I'm saying? I just said that. You can say, because you know what? I, I just realized I don't listen enough to you. I tell you what to do all the time and I don't always listen and clearly I still need to work on it. And then they won't know what to say. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's the intention. The other thing about the comp technique, because it is the medicine. It truly is. Mm -hmm. The more you use it, it's like a layer of paint that just gets thicker and thicker and thicker. And you'll just see those shoulders going back, the chin coming up. You'll just see this resilience, this emotional organization. This will just heal them and strengthen them from the inside out. And you don't have to teach them how to do this. When you do this on them, they will intuitively, naturally do this with their peers. It's like a phenomenal social skill. They'll do it back to you. There were so many times when my kids would walk away and go, did you notice? And I'm like, oh. You're good. Because when you get really good at it, you shouldn't even notice it. It's so smooth. It's so real. It's so genuine that it shouldn't feel like a technique. Mm -hmm. 
So that's the medicine part. Well, the other part, which I'll get to, is the, the limit setting is also really important because as children feel um, contained and they feel like you're in control, they don't have to go, uh, uh, they don't have to push those boundaries anymore. They can just mind their own business and be kids, right? So I'll give a really quick analogy and then we'll, we'll kind of get back to the, the mirroring piece because that's the real medicine. But let's say you were on an airplane and it was a turbulent, terrifying horrifyingly scary flight and the captain decides he's going to wander down the aisle how's everybody doing i could do twenty-eight thousand feet if you want I, I could try going around the storm what do you guys think what are you going to say to him are you crazy go fly the plane i'm a passenger why are you asking me that question go fly the plane right um for the purpose of argument if the if the cockpit door is open i can't do that on planes anymore but let's say it was and the captain's in there screaming and yelling why is this red button flashing? I don't understand why the control tower is not answering me and I, they don't pay me enough for this job. Are you gonna feel safe in that seat? And now we have to think about ourselves as parents. How do we look sometimes? Sometimes we're, honey, please get off the couch. Mommy needs you to get, please, please, can you get out of the box? Please, mommy needs, nobody's gonna do that. If the child is, is oppositional or strong-willed, that's a question and I can say no to that and no. Plus I feel how much you want me to do it, so no, right? Or they're gonna think, this person's not in charge. I'm in charge. I can do whatever I want. She keeps asking me if it's okay. I don't wanna be in charge, I'm six, right? The flip side is, if you're screaming and yelling and, and shrieking and you know, getting hysterical with your kids, which we all do from time to time, you're also out of control. And that's also showing your child that nobody's flying this plane. I'm in the passenger seat and nobody's flying the plane. So that's where the frontal lobe piece comes in. And what, oh, uh, one question too, what if you're watching this and as an adult, you're realizing that either through childhood trauma or the way you were brought up, your frontal lobe wasn't, wasn't established and strengthened mm -hmm. properly also. Mm -hmm. I feel like when you have a child, that may be more obvious. Yes, absolutely. And that's true. And there's a lot of us as adults that struggle with that. We are constantly in struggle with our frontal lobe, whether it's eating too much, eating not enough, spending too much, not spending enough, freaking out, getting mad, getting anxious. All of those things are really important, and this is why there's, there's, such a, um, there's such an important interaction with your child so that when you are using this technique, you are also getting medicated. You are also getting oxytocin. You are getting all of the reward chemicals that you may have missed as a child. Your brain can repair itself at any age, right? So when we, so the biggest issue that all of us have is that we kind of go around in life trying to control all the conditions. And you can never control the conditions in your life. You can only control your emotional response to those conditions. And so as you practice with these two kids and, and as you give yourself permission to blow it sometimes because you will, and now you have this wonderful way to repair, you are soothing and calming your own brain at the same time. That's the, that's the most incredible part of this whole, and, and you know what, I call it a technique. It's not really, it's more like a philosophy. It's more like a way of being. And the more you do it, it's like anything. The more you do it, the better you get at it. The better you get at it, the more you do it automatically. The more you do it automatically, the more it becomes part of who you are. And so you practice it all the time, on every one, all the time, every day. And the more you get that feedback, where you get that oxytocin blast back, and you see the other person calming down before your eyes, the more you go, whoa, I really do have a superpower. And the more you begin to use that and regrow, and regrow new neuro, regrow or develop new neuro pathways in your own brain, right? And you have to be kind to yourself and you have to forgive yourself. You're, you do your best on whatever the best looks like that day, right? The, and the other medicine, because you asked me about medicine, the other way to really do this, and we'll come back to the technique because the technique itself is complicated, um, is through what I call limbic bonding or baby play. This is where also where you get med medicine, right? So when you have a child that's acting out that's really or any child that just pushes your boundaries and just makes you frustrated and you get upset and you yell whatever it is you want to make sure that every day well you know 10 15 minutes a day you are focused looking in their eyes um, rubbing noses telling them how beautiful they are telling them stories about when they were a baby tickling them just having a moment where they just feel like they are cherished that they feel so deeply loved, you're gonna get such an oxytocin blast between the two of you and you can feel it. You can feel it, that that's healing you as well. I have a, I'll disguise the, um, 
the details because I want to make sure that I'm always protecting people's uh, privacy. But there was one client that really stands out in my mind when I think about this. This is a lovely woman and she, she'd actually found out towards the end of her, no, right around the time that they do the ultrasound. So maybe around the fourth month of pregnancy that, that the, the results came back and the baby was, you know, terribly, uh, there were terrible medical issues and they were, it was, it was not a viable pregnancy and the, they were going to have to do a therapeutic abortion. And so right away she started to disconnect and go through trauma and be incredibly upset about that. And then as she was heading down for the therapeutic abortion, this was also threatening her life as well, uh, or they thought, they called her and said, oh, I'm really sorry, we've made a mistake. It's a medical error. We've confused the files. Your baby's fine. So she turns around with her husband, she goes home and obviously is relieved, but emotionally could not reconnect because she kept thinking like, is it another medical, like how, they made this mistake, is there another mistake? How am I gonna be able to do this? And really struggled through the rest of her pregnancy through a lot of anxiety and the, the, the baby, um, was you know, healthy, born very, very healthy, little boy. Um, and he was super bright, super gifted. Gifted kids are a whole other story. That's a whole other podcast. Uh, highly sensitive, you know, couldn't breastfeed, screamed through the night, couldn't be settled. Uh, anxiety is, a, is an emotion that passes through the placenta. So he was born in cortisol soup and they were a mess, an absolute mess. And I was working through with the mom on how to use the calm technique and how to connect with her child. And, and it was really interesting because this child had developed such an icky defense mechanism. Like he was just icky. Like if she went to hug him, he would squeeze her. He'd pinch her. He'd be inappropriate. He'd just do icky things that would make her go, Ugh, why do you do that? And they would end up in this push, pull, I love you, I hate you dance, which is very common when you have attachment issues. And uh, he was so difficult. Anyway. One of the story that really stands out is when he was little, he was about maybe 18 months old. He would never sleep. He would never sleep. And both parents were just completely fried and exhausted and sleep deprived. And there was one night and we've all had ugly parent moments where she went in and she picked him up and she just said, stop it, just stop it, stop. And she's bawling while she's doing this. And the child is terrified as she's doing this. And the child, and it's, it's, not, it's not normal for a child to remember this, but he's super bright. So he, had, he did have a memory of this event and it came up in one of our sessions because I was also working with the child. So we did this amazing thing where I had the mom set up. He's, he's now five or six by the time I'm working with him. And she had him, I had her set up as much as she could in the little basement. There was a little bedroom in the basement, put the crib back, put the rocking chair back, put as much stuff as you still have back. And you're gonna play a game where he stands in the crib and he cries for you and you go in and you do it differently. This goes back to your question about repairing and redoing. So she walked in the room and he was, you know, crying and they're role playing, but he's screaming and she picks him up and she goes, come here, my darling. I know you're scared. You come with mama. And she pulls him into the rocking chair and they both wept. And they did this over and over and over again for a few days. And it was so repairing, it was so powerful, it was so healing. And that really began um, this change in this child, who by the way now is in university and awesome and doing fantastically well and the mother's doing fantastically well. Um, so that's how powerful this is. When I say medicine, I'm not kidding. Next to food and water, this is the most important thing that you can give your child. So that baby play where you're rubbing noses and you're tickling is medicine and you're getting healed there too. And I always say to parents, because sometimes they'll go, oh, I'm really mad at this kid. Like, how many minutes do I have to do it for? Like, really? And I always say the child that you least feel like doing this with is the child that needs it the most. So if your first instinct is, oh, really? You got you to gotta get the Academy Award. You just got to go in there and you have to do it. That, that really tells me how afraid that bond actually is. Not because you don't love your child, but because when you have a frustrating, challenging child, it frays the bond, it frays your nerves, and they're smart enough to know that they are pretty icky sometimes, and they know that you love them, but they don't feel very lovable sometimes, and the reason is they're not sometimes. Sometimes they're just not, and it can take you to the darkest places of your soul as a parent, and I work with so many parents who are literally waking up with a pit in their stomach, 
worrying about their child, feeling sick about how they parented the day before, wanting to do things differently, but they keep getting stuck in this rut where their child is just pulling them back into this negative dynamic. And even if it's just shades of this, let's get on this. Let's, you know, I was just, uh, it, I was just thinking about this the other day. Like if you were driving on the highway and your gas light came on, you wouldn't stick a happy face sticker on it and go, oh, well, that'll be fine. But we do that all the time as parents. Like, oh, it's a stage. Oh, you know, I don't need to do anything. It'll, it'll probably get better on its own. Why? Just pull over and get gas. Like really deal with this now, no matter what age your child is, it will never be easier than now. Ten, problems tend to get worse over time, not better. And even if you don't have any problems with your kid, this is brain food. This is emotional nutrition. Why would you not give them every possible neurological edge that you could possibly give them? So the, the baby play is delicious. It is medicine. And it, it, it's, uh, it, if you did that, if you ignored everything else, I'm telling you, and you just did that, you would see a change in your child's behavior. Hands down. Very cool. I love that. Ladies, if you're here, do you have any other questions? Is this technique resonating with you? Anna, Amy, any other ladies that are on? Feel free to, to pop in the chat box or say something. Oh, I saw someone unmute. Anna? Hi, I'll, I'll, I'll speak. Um, it's, I, I'm following along because I, I too uh, personally suffer from my own depression and anxiety. And so this is interesting to kind of Vanessa, you had talked originally about um, kind of learning about how your parents did things or, or you know, so it's allowing me to reflect um, on my own kind of upbringing and what I've learned, but also then how I can shift that and talk differently to myself when I'm going through those situations and being hijacked and, um, you know, with my own brain, but then also in, in how to talk to um, anyone going through that. So, that, so it's, it's interesting. I'm, I'm waiting for the, the mirrors, the, the mirror technique, I guess, at the end, the last bit. Yep. Fantastic. And, and you raised something so important, Anna, which is that for this technique to truly work, you have to use the same calm technique on yourself. You must be compassionate and loving to yourself. If you're going to be your own parent, then why would you be a mean parent to yourself? Right. You have to find a place where you, you do the same thing with yourself. When you're getting angry and saying, you idiot, what kind of parent are you? Why, you know, why would you do that? Or you know better than this? Or all the books you've read, you shouldn't behave this way. Really kind of pain and even emotional pain is information. It's information. And, neg and emotions, I won't even say negative, but what, what have been called negative emotions, anxiety, depression, frustration, anger. Um, emotions get such a bad rap. They are information. That is how our body talks to us. And trying to shove them away or say we're you know broken somehow because we have them um, we're messing up our gps system emotions are our emotional gps system they're telling us when we are too far from the best version of ourselves mm -hmm. right so when we're nasty to ourselves um and we're not mirroring to ourselves we're going to throw our gps way off so it really is important to have that self-compassion and to be able to do a repair. So even if you have had a terrible moment, you beat yourself up, which mothers do to themselves all the time, and people do it to themselves all the time, go back and, and mirror to yourself. You, know, you were just feeling awful, and you were feeling really scared, and you were feeling threatened, or you were feeling shame. And that's an awful way to feel, and that's information. And kind of sit in that for a second before you move on. Um, I think looking at um, emotions as as a GPS system, it's how our, our body helps us figure out how close we are to what we want to be doing and how far we are from what we need to be doing is really, really important. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about yelling, very popular parenting technique, yelling. Um, but it really, uh, it's not that effective. And, and we know that because anyone who's a parent um, or anyone who's a human, um, you can, there's no way you can think of a time where someone has yelled at you, screamed at you, reprimanded you, bawled you out, and you've gone, oh, oh, thank you so much. Thank you. That was perfect. I, oh, that's what I needed. Thank you. Like, would anyone ever do that ever? No, because that's, that's no, that would never work. All that does is set your emotional GPS system off. So you start becoming anxious, you start feeling threatened, and then you start reacting 
instead of responding. And so when we yell um, at our kids, you know, we sometimes think that they feel things differently because they're children, but they don't. They feel ex they, they feel exactly the way we feel it right now. Um, and when you when you yell, basically you're just reacting instead of responding to your child. And that's when so many parents, so many moms will say to me, like, I was such a nice person before I had kids. And and now I'm just yelling all the time. I don't like who I am anymore. I don't want to be. This is not what I signed up for. Um, and yelling will do that to you. And it, it just keeps you in that loop, in that vibrating, angry state. And here's a little bit of a tip. When you're angry at another person and what's coming out of your mouth feels fantastic, that's how you know it's wrong. It should feel stuck. It should feel like, oh, I'm really getting angry. And you should feel yourself pushing it back down. That's how you know that your frontal lobe is working. That's how you know your frontal lobe is online. It hasn't gone offline yet. When you're screaming and you're yelling and you're, or you're you know, shouting or going off on someone, um, what you're doing in that moment is you're basically just limbic. You're basically just a giant amygdala. It's the, it's the primitive limbic survival part of the brain that is, is reacting. And you kind of have to remember in any conflict you will have a limbic reaction first. We like to think of ourselves as thinking beings and feeling beings, but we're actually the opposite. We, we feel, we, we react first just to make sure it's not too dangerous. And then it goes up to the frontal lobe and then we can calm ourselves down. So our first reaction, whether it's a sibling or our husband or a boss or our own children is usually a limbic reaction. It's usually survival, uh, primitive reaction. And if you just calm down and you, relax your tongue in the bottom of your mouth. You just let your tongue go soft and you change your breathing and you relax your jaw and your shoulder. Your stomach should let go. Right away, you're telling your brain that you're not actually in physical danger. You're not actually in a situation where you could be you know, attacked or chased or killed or whatever it is. Um, that is a way to keep your frontal lobe back on. Um, and that'll keep you responding to your children instead of reacting to your children. So thank you. I really love what you just said about the self-love though. That's really important. That's really important. Yeah, I love this. This is so beautiful. I feel like we could talk forever. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And yeah, go ahead. I'm excited to hear about this uh, mirror technique. Okay, so yeah. let's, let's go through some examples. So I'm only seeing myself on the screen. Can we, can we flip it somehow so I can see you? Yeah, can you? I'm gonna, need, I'm gonna need you for this. Can you see me now? Nope. Okay. I just... Um, can you in the top right hand corner you can change your view? Okay, let's that? there. Oh, okay. that's awesome. okay. Okay, so I'm gonna need you for this. Okay, so I'm ready. Would be really <laughs> good is we can we can kind of do a role play. Okay. All right? This is something you have to sort of experience. You have to see it. So. Um, I can give you the scenario you, if you want, or you can come up yes, with this. Go for it. You can give me the scenario. So let's do a, let's do a fun one. Let's, let's do, let's say you're a teenage girl and you have worked really hard on your hair. Okay. And, and when you're a teenager, you think the whole, just so channel your inner 14 year old. Okay. You remember what she was like. Mm -hmm. you think everybody's looking at you. Um, you're just constantly in a state of, of embarrassment. Um, you think, you know, that everyone's going to notice every little hair that's out of place. You are late and your mom's yelling at you and we're going to role play this. So the first way we're going to do it is I'm not going to be, a, I'm not going to use the mirroring technique. I'm not going to use the calm technique. I'm going to be a typical mom who's just in a hurry and we got to get out the door and you just, you just dig in and be the best teenager you can check. Okay. Okay. Um, so you're already mad. Like you've been trying to get your hair to go the way you want it to, and it's not cooperating and you're just starting to feel awful and ugly and that people are going to make fun of you or whatever your biggest fear is as a 13 year old or 14 year old. And I'm coming upstairs getting upset with you. So let's just jump in. And the second time we do it, I'm going to mirror and I want you to feel the difference. And then the people who right. are watching will also feel the difference. Right. So I'd say, honey, what are you doing? I woke you up at 45 minutes ago. Let's go. You've got to get downstairs and have your breakfast. Come on. I'm doing my hair, mom. Okay. You've had 45 minutes to do your hair. It's fine. Your hair looks fine. Let's go. Come down the stairs now, please. Hurry up. It's not fine. I don't want it like this. I need more time. You don't have more time, honey. You don't have more time. We've got to get in the car now. Put a hat on or something. Let's go. 
No, no, I don't care. I'm going to be late for school. You can't be late for school. Your brothers and sisters are in the car. They don't need to be late for school. You need to wake up like an hour and a half earlier if you have this much trouble with your hair. Put it in a bun. And I don't care, mom. I don't care. I'm going to call an you Uber. You don't, you're, you're not calling an Uber, okay? That's expensive. Get it. Just get in the car. No, mom. No, no. I'd let just give me five more minutes. Five more minutes. Oh, I don't have five more minutes. So anything happening here that's motivating you? <laughs> no, you just want to keep fighting. <laughs> you want to keep fighting. So yeah. absolutely. So so the experience that you're having is I don't get you. I'm not listening to you in the slightest. You've asked me for five more minutes. You've offered a couple of solutions. I'm not even listening to you. And you're escalating, not de-escalating, mm -hmm. correct? Okay. So let's try this again. Okay. Channel your four, inner 14 year old, do your best. Okay. And I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna mirror this time. And okay. I'm gonna use the calm technique. So you're looking for me to clarify, to summarize, to wonder out loud, and I'm gonna do all those things and I'll break it down for you. Okay. So I would say, um, I'd probably come up and say, um, okay, sweetie, you know what? Is your hair not cooperating today? You said, no, you? mom, I've been working on this and I just, it's not right. My hair is a disaster today. I'm sorry, honey. You've been working so hard at it. And some days your hair works and sometimes it just decides. I know, to but this today is really important, mom. And you really feel like this has to be right, right? Mm -hmm. For you to feel comfortable and confident at school. Yeah. I just need a little bit more time. I'm not ready. I can't go to school like this. So you know what? I get it. Cause you feel like every, and what part of your hair isn't like, what is not working about? It just isn't the right like shape. It's all frizzy and I just, it's not working and it just doesn't look good. Do you have a vision in your head of how you want your hair to look? And this yeah. is not it. Yeah. I'm looking at you and I feel like you look beautiful, but I'm your daughter. So I probably yeah, always mom, you're that. always going to say that. No, it's true. And I don't see what you see, but you see it. And that's the important thing. When you look in the mirror, you see that the shape isn't right. And there's no way you feel like you look like this. So I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes. I want you to really think about this and see if you can kind of see if you can just sort of live with it or get it to at least a point where you feel like you can leave the house and not feel really horrible. Can I check back on you in a couple minutes? Yeah, that would be good. I just need some more time. Okay, sweetie. And then when it's time to go, so now let's say it's time to go. So think how you would feel after that. And I would say, you know what? How's it, how you doing? Not good. I, I still need a little bit more time. There's all poor. I feel terrible for you because you spent so much time on it. Okay, here's what we're gonna have to do. I'm gonna get in the car. I'm going to trust you that somehow you're going to follow me into the car and you've got the inner strength. I believe in you. I know that you can do this because I also know that you've gone to school on other days when you've hated your hair. So I'm going to head to the car now and I'm going to trust you that you're going to be behind me. Okay. I'm getting in the car right now. I don't know. Well, I'm going, I'm going to go get in the car. I, I, you make your way down. So do you see, I dropped the rope there. Mm -hmm. So, you still might not get in the car. If it's a real vortex, you might not. But how did the second one go? Definitely much better. I definitely felt like you were listening to me. You understood me. Like I wasn't fighting you. I wasn't trying to win. It was just like we were in a, this situation and like you were my friend and you were with me in that. Yep. And then the second time when I came back and I, I had to put the pressure on, what I did was I gave you a message of confidence. I believe in you. I know you've gotten through this before. I know this feels huge to you, but I'm going to trust that you're going to be in the car. And for most kids, I'm not joking. Like most kids, I would say 95% of the time, go down the stairs. Don't stand there waiting for her to come. Go down the stairs, get in the car. They will come. Hmm. And when they do, don't go, oh, you came. See, you did it. Don't do that. Because then they'll never get in the car again. Mm -hmm. Don't say a word. Don't say anything about her hair. Don't have it. Don't continue the discussion. Just act normal and then drop her off, right? Sometimes we have a parade and we make such a big deal and teenagers are already, already so embarrassed. In the small amount of time that a child wouldn't get in the car, and honestly, most of them do, there is a small fraction of kids that would not, but most actually do want to get to school. They don't want to push the boundary of not going. They do want to see their friends. They don't want to find out what happens if they don't go. So they would stomp down the stairs. Like probably in this scenario, you would come stomping down the stairs, grab your bag, slam the door and say, don't talk to me. Like that's what a lot of teenagers would do. Right. And then don't get into the, you know what? I was really nice to you and you don't have to be rude to me. I'm not just, 
you're not going to win in that, in that situation. You can keep mirroring if you want, or just let them put their headphones on and just later you can go back and revisit. Mm -hmm. So in that, um, scenario, I clarified what, so where, like, what isn't working about your hair? Like what was happening? And then you were able to tell me, um, I could wonder out loud, which was like wondering how you're going to feel when you go to school, when you feel like your hair is like, looks, you know, exact opposite of how you want it to look. I, I can paraphrase. So she, I, I forget some of the things you were saying, but now it looks terrible. It doesn't look the way I want to at all. Oh, so it's just not even close to the way you want it to look. I don't say the exact same thing because that's kind of weird, but I say a variation of what you just said. Um, and I can summarize, which I don't think I did in this one, but I could say, you know, oh, and maybe I did, that sometimes your hair works out. And then sometimes there's other days where it just doesn't, this is not the first time this happened to you. But you see how I'm borrowing the urgency here? Mm -hmm. I'm with you here. Instead of fighting you here, I'm with you here. So a lot of parents say to me, oh, I don't have time to do that. That's a lot of work. I don't have time to do that. My answer is you don't have time not to. How was that going to keep going the first time? Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to get you in that car. That was going to go on and on and on until I left her there screaming or she finally did get in the car and we were mad at each other. Like it, that was ugly and it wasn't going to go anywhere. Right. And obviously as we're human. There will be moments where a parent just loses it. Mm -hmm. This is ridiculous. Like you're going to lose it. And then you go back and you repair and you do everything I just did later you know what, you're so careful about how you want your hair to look and you have such a strong idea of the look that you want it to have and it just wouldn't work this morning and I didn't care at all. I just yelled at you to get in the car. Even there, you can feel what's happening, right? Mm -hmm. So even though this is a role play and you are not 13 and your hair looks fabulous, by the way, mm -hmm. um, your mirror neuron cells in your brain can't tell the difference. So could you feel the oxytocin? Totally, yeah. That's the medicine. Mm -hmm. That's the medicine. And so... The, the, the point at which parents are going to struggle the most with this is when they're mad, is when they're frustrated, is when they're limbic or their own frontal lobe has shut off or it's triggering childhood issues, mm -hmm. um, which is going to happen. But the repair is the magic, right? That's where you can always go back and repair. And so in those moments, um, you're not going to do your best mirroring. So I want, I don't want people to go, oh, this is great. I can't wait for my child to be upset. I'm going to use it. No, you can use it when they're happy, when they're telling you about a video game, when they're complaining about a supply teacher. You know, we love to have these teaching moments. Wait, there were a supply teacher today. She was so mean. What's the response we almost always give? Well, honey, you know, it gives you time to have different kinds of teachers and you can learn a lot and you only have her for a couple of days. We go into cheerleading mode, which makes the gig. Oh, no, she really is so mean, right? We, and then we get upset that our children are not um, value, you know, uh, uh, valuing and appreciating our parenting moment. <laughs> but we come in with that too soon. You've got to set the stage first. So you've got a mirror and you've got to say, what, what do you mean? Like, what did she do? She what? I, you don't have, it's not agreeing. It's getting. Mm -hmm. You can actually come back and say all the stuff I just said. You know, you're going to have different teachers and it teaches your brain ways to handle different adults. Um, but you've got a mirror first. Mm. You have to connect before you correct. Mm -hmm. That's really, really important. Yeah, that's amazing, even just for friendships and relationships. Always. That's oh, really absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. when you go back to repair, how much time would you recommend to leave in between? Like, how do you know when you're ready to go back and have that conversation? That's a really good question. When you can go back and really feel your own frontal lobe, when you can actually feel your ability to go right in there and see it from the, from your, from the other person's perspective, whoever it is, that's when you're ready. And you, it's good to know yourself, mm -hmm. right? And often it can, if you don't get the response right away, it can send you right back into fight or flight and you can feel rejected or feel hurt. Here's a couple of tips that can really help you too, because that this technique takes practice. So number one, practice it on everybody. The lady at Starbucks, the person you think took your spot in the parking lot, like just, step up and just do it and watch, watch what happens. Watch the power that comes back. Watch the, um, the, the, the amazing things that will happen to you when you approach the world this way is astonishing. And they're healing, not just for the person you're talking to, but for yourself. Um, the second is to try and keep your frontal lobe on. So there was the breathing technique I just taught, you know, dropping your shoulders, relaxing your stomach. Having a thought in your head, like um, your, your child's screaming, yelling about the drawing, if we go back to that, and they ripped it up, or your, the, the daughter with the hair. 
if you're thinking in your head, oh, she's so disrespectful and this is so ridiculous and what a privileged child that she's just worrying about her stupid hair when there's children in the world who, you know, are walking to school and getting their water and, you know, that's kind of where we go. Or if she's flipping out about her hair, how's she going to have any skills to handle the future? Park all that and just think in your head. I'm, you, you literally, in your head, you say, I'm sorry you're in so much pain and you don't know what else to do. Because even though that looks ridiculous to us, that 13 year old, she is in pain. She is in pain because she is feeling vulnerable. She is feeling afraid. She's feeling like if her hair is in a certain way that she's gonna be judged, she's gonna be laughed at, she's gonna be bullied or picked on. You have no idea what she's going, what's she's going on, what's going on for her at school. And even if nothing is, social media, the self-marketing, the pressure on young people to look a certain way is astounding. We had it when we were kids. It is multiplied infinitely now. And how mean and vicious kids are to each other online, you have no idea the kind of texts that are flying back and forth between that child and her friend, right? So that's what's going on. So you say to yourself, I'm sorry. Don't say it out loud. I'm sorry you're in so much pain and you don't know what else to do. Just keep saying that over and over again in your head. As your child is, can you just be that anchor? You just kind of be that rock while the wind is blowing at you, you keep saying that over and over again and do the mirroring. That will calm you down. That will get you into a place where you can actually do that calm technique, which you will have been practicing. So hopefully it's coming sooner or quicker to you and watch the change. Watch the change in your daughter. Watch the change in your son. If you're a step parent, developing relationships with your stepkids, don't do, just, just mirror. Just do, there's two types of parenting. There's soft parenting and hard parenting. I mean, they both come together. Soft parenting is connecting, baby play, finding out stories about them when they were little, going through the baby books, all of that wonderful stuff. And then there's the hard parenting, go to bed, brush your teeth. Um, when you're entering into a parenting role as a step parent, you don't jump into the hard parenting stuff right away. You earn that through the soft parenting, through the connection, through the building of that relationship. Um, you know, you sort of demonstrate to your child that when, when you're upset, they're upset, you're someone that they'll actually be able to feel listened to and heard and not parented and judged. And it's not about being their best friend. It's not about agreeing. It's about getting. And that's all people ever want. They don't even want you to agree if you don't agree. They just want you to get them. And then you'll earn your way back into doing that, that harder parenting. And, it'll, and it'll, it, it will be so much more well-received because it will be coming from a place of love, right? Of, of a demonstration of consistent listening and understanding and love. And that's, that's when parenting gets easier. So you asked me at the beginning, like how do you, once you've been continuously doing this stuff, when you actually go to hard parent them, they're like, fine, instead of flipping out. And you'll see fewer meltdowns. They won't last as long. They'll recover much faster. And then eventually over time, you'll see a reduction in the, in the intensity. And, and this all sounds lovely and it sounds easy, but it's hard. <laughs> like it's counterintuitive. Yeah. Yeah. I think acknowledging that it is hard and it takes work, you know, you're one step closer because then you're ready to put in that work. Yeah. And the best things always take work. Mm -hmm. If something, if somebody tells you like something is an easy peasy, super quick, quick fix, I would wonder about that. Like usually the best things take mastery mm -hmm. and commitment and the, the thing about this technique is even your clumsy attempts at the beginning um, will work. They're better than not doing it for sure. Um, and I would certainly say that there'll never be an easier time than now to invest in these techniques, but they do take practice. And that's, that's why we coach parents and we actually really work with parents, but it's astounding. Like I've had so many families where their child has literally been turned around in a matter of, of weeks, like kids who were given, quite a serious prognosis, like oppositional defiant disorder and major behavioral issues and even anxiety. Like this is a phenomenal way to, to work with your child when they're anxious and it also helps your anxiety as well. Wow. Yeah. That's so powerful. Thank you honestly so much for sharing it. It, I think will change so many relationships, especially of these women that are on listening now. And even if some men, if you're watching, it works for men too. Um, I do want to be cautious of time. 
So is there anything else you wanted to go over before we finish up or go into some last um, Maybe really, really quickly, I want to just say something quickly about consequences because I don't yes. want people to think that connected parenting is only about the soft stuff. Mm -hmm. Equally, the other side is consequences. Consequences need to be uh, natural consequences whenever possible. They need to be pre-agreed upon. If you continue with that behavior, please understand you will be going into a timeout or you will be losing 15 minutes of your screens or your phone for 24 hours or whatever it is. Don't take things away for a month. Take it away for 24 hours and then they then they get it back. If they repeat that same behavior, they lose it again. They may still lose it for a month, but at least this way it's been a contract every time. Mm -hmm. um, there's so much, I mean, there's just, there's no way to even touch all of this, but yeah. when you do give consequences, we tend to give them when we're mad. That's it. Now you're not going to go trick-or-treating or canceling your birthday or we're not going to Florida. Or if you've been saving your money to go on a trip to Florida, you're not going to not go to Florida and your kids know it. So don't put out these ridiculous big consequences that you've said in anger. It's much better to say to your children, there is going to be a consequence. I'm not exactly sure what it is. I'm going to go think about it and I'm going to come up with a consequence that actually makes sense. That's fair. And then come back an hour later and give the consequence. First of all, they'll be sitting there for an hour nervous. <laughs> what are you going to give me? Um, but you'll come up with something that's much more reasonable, right? Cause when we, when we do like really kind of big sweeping consequences, we usually end up going back on them. And we end up going back on them. Our kids feel like no one's flying a plane. They're like, great. Uh, she doesn't mean what she says. Dad mm -hmm. says it, but he doesn't mean it. So I don't know who's in charge here. I guess I am. And then they keep pushing and pushing and pushing those boundaries. So that, that, that would be kind of the other piece that I, and I didn't really get to talk to about much today, but that's, that's yeah. you. Yeah, we can definitely, we'll have to talk more and see if we can come back and do some more chats because there is so much to talk about consequences, all that jazz, social media, how to, you know, even in the beginning of the talk, you had mentioned that now is some of the most difficult times ever to parent a child. So just we can go a little bit more into that later of, you know, oh, what makes that yeah. difficult. And if you ladies want more resources, I will email and I'll also put all of her information if you're watching later in the description of the video below. And you can go to connectedparenting.com. She has, you can talk a little bit more about that too, Jennifer, sure. your six program and everything if they want to see if it's a good fit for them. Sure. So connected parenting, I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of us. I've trained a number of therapists in this technique. Um, and because it often gets confused with active listening, that's when you're saying things like, I understand that must be really frustrating or I'm hearing that. And there's nothing wrong with that technique, but because it has observational statements in it, it kind of makes the person feel like you're I call it the customer service response. I understand, ma'am, that must be very frustrating, but there's a lilt, there's a song, there's a rhythm in your voice that lets the person know you're about to say but, mm. right? So the, the con technique is actually tricky. So there's a team of us, um, and we work with clients from all over the world. Um, we have a whole online thing. And then we have, which I'm really proud of, I'm really excited about actually, because we changed so many lives, that I've been trying to think of a way to get this message out to as many people as possible especially people who can't necessarily afford to see a therapist privately every week. So I've created an online six week course, which feels like this. It feels like I'm right in front of you. And it, I take parents through every single step of the technique of the containment, dealing with homework, meltdown, social media, sibling issues, picky, you name it, whatever it is, it's in that course. And it really kind of loads parenting a parents up with a fantastic toolbox and with a lot of examples um, a lot of role playing, really going deep into the, the mirroring technique, which is harder than it looks. Yeah. Like it, it takes some practice. Yeah. You ladies will have to let us know, practice the mirror technique and then let us know how it goes for you. <laughs> yeah. We do have a one question too. We'll get to that uh, just quickly and then we will head out. But what are some techniques for setting boundaries with children? Okay. So let me, can I get more clarification on that question? So boundaries like what, what are you, what are you talking about? Let's see, it, whoever asked that question, can you just add some clarification so we can get some more information? If, are they misbehaving? Why and where? Do you, the bedroom, like what kind of boundaries are we talking about? If not, I'll do a general answer. Okay. Okay, let me start answering it in the, if they're- yeah, if Perfect, they're and then I'm sure they'll hop on, yeah. So like anything, so whatever that boundary is, you want them to respect your space, your bedroom, or you want them to not talk back to you, whatever that boundary is. Um, in order to begin that conversation, you have to start with the mirroring. Like you, whatever boundary they've crossed, like the hair or whatever it is, you have to mirror that. 
using the calm technique exactly the way that I described it. And then you present the problem. But the problem is I'm an adult and you can't talk to me that way. Or the problem is this is my bedroom and you just burst in the door and didn't knock. Whatever the boundary is, you present the problem and then you follow that up with a solution. What could the solution be? Can we work together to come up with a solution that's going to help us so we're not in this situation again? And follow that up with a message of confidence. I believe in you. I know you can do this. I know you're a nicer person than this. I know that you understand boundaries because you understand boundaries at school or you understand boundaries at grandma's house. So I know you can do this. So let's work together. So that, that, that's kind of the, if I were to map it out for you, it would look like that. And you've got, and the, the tricky part is everybody's boundaries are different. And sometimes as parents, you have completely different boundaries. So often parents polarize. One is like, oh, he's fine. Leave him alone. It's not his fault. And the other one's like, this is ridiculous. This kid's out of control. We got to do something. And you end up polarizing and you end up trying to compensate for what you believe is a weakness in the other one's parenting. Right. And then you end up being a caricature of yourself. So even if um, you're a single parent, you've got to get on board with yourself. And if you're parenting with a spouse or a partner, you've got to find a way to come to the middle. And that's where connected parenting is so amazing. It absolutely requires that you start in the middle. Mm -hmm. Right. You start with the you, oh, sorry, that you start with the compassion. You start with the listening. You start with the creation of safety with the connecting before correcting and once that's done then you set the boundary then you set the pro or, or whatever the problem is the problem is you've got to behave this way or this is going to happen and then you can come in with the consequences so the tougher parent has to start out soft and the softer parent has to eventually get tougher and then you end up working together and then you end up complementing each other instead of conflicting with one another and and that's why and and if parents are thinking oh i don't think my spouse would do this it doesn't matter if you're the only one doing it, it'll still work. It'll, it'll help your child be more resistant and more resilient and emotionally organized. So even if the other parent is not doing it at all, it'll still work. Perfect. Yeah. They said that you totally answered their question on boundaries. So that is great. I'm yeah. so awesome. Well, yeah. honestly, Jennifer, thank you so much for being here. I mm -hmm. listen to you and talk to you all day. I love your approach and how mindful you are of every element involved. And I think it's so important. It's, really refreshing and definitely the movement moving forward. So I, I want your program <laughs> and I don't even have children. I think it's so cool. It's a gift that you can give yourself. And if you do have children, it's the gift they will give to their children. 100%. Yeah. That's so beautiful. Awesome. Well, I will send out an email with all of Jennifer's information and then attach that and we'll continue being in contact. Let us know, ladies, keep us updated on how you're doing and please reach out to Jennifer. If you have any questions or you want to chat with her further, with you or your partner and or you also do child therapy as well i do so, uh, that's an option yeah so thanks again happy tuesday and enjoy your evening bye bye